Hey, Vineyard Columbus, it's good to be with you this weekend. I'm Charles Montgomery, and I serve as the East Campus Pastor. I'm here with our Associate Pastor, Pastor Julia Pickerel. And on behalf of all of our campuses, we want to wish all of you a very warm and hearty welcome. That's right. It is so good to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining us, Vineyard Columbus. I'd like to give a special shout out to those of you who might be just coming in for the first time. Maybe you've checked us out once before, but either way, if you are new to Vineyard Columbus, hello, thank you for being here. And please drop a line in the chat. One of our pastors will reach out and say hi. Amen. And we want to take some intentional time at the beginning of our service just to acknowledge that we live in a country right now that's in very serious pain. Mm -hmm. Once again, racism has raised its ugly head and it just threatens to tear at the very fabric of our community. That's right. And we also recognize that this isn't just an abstract experience, mm -hmm. but that brothers and sisters in our community are experiencing things like this every day. And our, our, our community as a whole is grieving. Amen. And while there's just so much chaos in our community, we just want to again acknowledge that it's just timely that we happen to be in a series that's talking about hope. Mm -hmm. It is hope that really ushers us from chaos to community, not just community with one another, but also community with God. And so it's in that spirit of hope that we would ask that you would prepare your hearts as we turn to worship our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Amen. 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 He is truthfully the King forever. Well, before we take a moment to worship, I just wanna invite you to take just a second, maybe take a deep breath and turn your attention to the Lord right now. I know the longer that we are apart, it is so easy to disconnect, but I'm gonna pray and invite God's spirit. And as I do that, I just invite you to engage, to focus your attention on the Lord, to invite his spirit to speak to you. Would you pray with me? God, we turn our hearts to you now. We know, Lord, that wherever we are, wherever we're watching from, that you are there with us. And so we ask, Lord, would you help us to be aware of your presence, of your spirit, of your nearness to us. And I ask, Lord, that you would meet each of us in a unique way, God. We turn our hearts to you in worship. We remember who you are and all of your goodness. You're worthy of our time. You're worthy of our attention and all of our praise. So we pour that out now. And ask that you would have your way with us. Amen. Amen.
battles and you're victorious every time. Thank you, Lord. Together, found in your name. And found in your name, the power to save with only a whisper, mountains shake. Jesus, our hope and strength. And you made a way.
you're at right now, if you want to lift your hands, if you want to get up out of your seat, we're going to declare the worthiness, the glory of God. We're going to lift his name high today. He's the king above all kings. He's the Lord of lords. So would you join me? Would you worship with me together? Let's sing this. All the earth, all the earth will shout your praise. We lift you up, God.
God, we just declare that is true, that you are great, that you are good, that you are worthy of our worship. God, we join with all of heaven today in singing your praises. Our worthy King, We love you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your nearness to us. Would you continue to be close? We pray this in Jesus' name. Hi, if you're just joining us right now, I want to extend a welcome again and say thank you so much for being here with us at Vineyard Columbus especially for those of you who might be visiting us for the first time, or maybe this is your second time watching online. I am so glad that you are here with us. We would love to be more connected to those of you who are just joining us for the first couple of times. And there's a really easy way to do that. You just need to grab your phone and send us a text message. You can text the word hi to the number 98977. You can also click on a link that's going to appear in the chat in just a moment. Both of those things are gonna connect you to what's called a connect card. You just fill that out and one of our pastors will really quickly be able to reach out to you and let you know a little bit more about who we are as a church. For every connect card that we get uh, turned into us, we also get to partner with a great organization in our country called Convoy of Hope. So for every one of those connect cards, we donate $5 on your behalf to Convoy. Convoy of Hope is a great humanitarian organization that's doing amazing uh, work in our state, in our city, in our country, and across the world. So just by turning in that Connect card and reaching out to us, you get to partner in doing something good in a world that really desperately needs it. Again, thank you so much for being here with us. I'm glad to have you worshiping with us today. Right now, we're going to turn things over to Pastor Charles Montgomery as we continue our worship as a time of taking the offering. Praise the Lord again, my brothers and sisters. This is Pastor Charles Montgomery. And for those of you all just joining us in our worship experience, we wanna wish you a very warm and hearty welcome. We do wanna continue in our worship experience through the giving of our tithes and our offering. Our tithes and offering are really our gifts back to God. And this weekend marks 50 days after we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We call that Pentecost. And this weekend we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, where God gave the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church, the Holy Spirit who empowers us to be witnesses to the world. I shared with you on last week that when you give, you also help our church to develop communities of disciples who experience God, love one another, and partner with Christ to heal the world. So we thank you for your sacrifice of giving, and we thank you for your spirit of generosity. We pray that you continue to give in the spirit of generosity, and there's many ways in which you can do that. You can actually, the easiest way is to be able to utilize our text to give option. Just text the amount to 614. 614- 333-0330, or there are other ways in which you can give which are appearing upon the screen right now. Again, thank you so much for your gifts. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to hear from our associate pastor, Pastor Eric Piccaro. Lord, we thank you for these gifts, and we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, the comforter and the paraclete that helps us to be witnesses to the world. I pray, Lord, that you would bless these gifts Bless each giver, bless each viewer. We give this to you in Jesus' name, amen. Now let's hear from our our associate pastor, Pastor Eric Pickerel. Hey, Vineyard family. 
It's good to be with you again. We are finishing a series that we've been doing called The Reason for Our Hope. And we're looking at First Peter and we're talking about hope in times of crisis. Right now, we are in a terrible crisis, really a double crisis. Not only is our whole world experiencing this awful pandemic, but right now our nation is experiencing a terrible crisis. We're watching Minneapolis burn. We're seeing protests in Columbus and in cities all across our nation. People are in so much pain for what they have seen this week as they've watched another unacceptable death as George Floyd was pinned to the ground, as he cried out, I can't breathe. And as he breathed his last right in front of all of these cameras. And you know what? These cameras, we're we're seeing more and more what has always been there under the surface, right? I, I think of an iceberg. What we're seeing on display is just the tip of the iceberg of what is underneath. And I know people of color, brown people and black people, you experience this every day. But for me, every iceberg that I see pass by, it's another shock. It's another terrible shock. And not only that, but I think of it really like waves crashing. I mean, there's been so many that we've seen in recent weeks, not just George Floyd, but Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, and we know that there are so many more waves that have just crashed against our American shore. You know, the thing that I think is an injustice on top of the injustice in this is that most of us will remember George Floyd and how he died. Uh, George Floyd handcuffed and pinned to the ground, a knee in his neck, and him gasping for breath. But I want you to remember something that many of you may not know about George. George was a brother in Christ. This week on Twitter, so many Christian artists were giving a shout out to George. Uh, I want you to hear what some folks said from within our Christian community about the impact of his life. Corey Paul, a Christian artist said, He'd help us when we had church at the basketball court in the middle of the hood. When we did community outreach in the hood, he was a person of peace. He wanted to see us come together as a people. The artist Reconcile said this about him. He said that one time they dragged a pool into the projects so that into the basketball court so that we could baptize dudes in the hood. The man that helped put down and clean up chairs at outreaches in the hood, a man of peace, a good man. Uh, I love this picture that Jay Monty posted on Twitter. And that man holding the Bible is George Floyd. I heard his brother and his family refer to him as a gentle giant, which to me really touch my heart because that's the same term I used to describe my oldest son, a gentle giant. His brother said, I love my brother. Everybody loves my brother. Knowing my brother is to love my brother. He was a very loving person and he didn't deserve what happened to him. Brothers and sisters, when you think of George Floyd, I want you to think about a brother in Christ. And I know that so many of you, especially those who are people of color in our community are hurting. You are tired and you're angry and you're sad and you're scared and you're tired of being angry and sad and scared. And I know that there are some of you who are parents and you are raising black sons and black daughters And you are honestly terrified as you look out at our society. I I want you to know that as a church, as a pastor of Vineyard Columbus, I want you to know that we are doing everything we can and we are committed to doing everything we can to providing a community of care, 
of love, of support, of protection, of prayer for you and your kids. We see you and we love you. And may I speak a word to our white brothers and sisters. See, I know that for so many of us, it doesn't touch us as closely as it does for our brothers and sisters of color. And I want to encourage you right now. Pastor Charles in Friday morning's devotional, he, he talked about a, a child that gets stung by a bee. He said, you know, if your child gets stung by a bee, what would you do? You would run over to your child. You would care for your child. You'd wipe your child's tears away and give them a big hug right now. We have brothers and sisters in our community who have been stung and they haven't just been stung once. They've been stung over and over and over again. And so may I invite us to take a posture of listening of learning, of hearing stories, of opening our ears and our eyes to the cries of our brothers and sisters, of allowing our hearts to be broken. You see, unless we are broken, America can't be healed. Unless we are healed, America won't be changed. It has to start with us, church. It begins here. And there are two actions that I want to call us to this week. First of all, on Monday, I want to invite you. We have a special podcast episode of The In-Between. And Julie and I, along with pastors Adrian and Pastor Charles, are going to, along with leaders of color in our community, talk about suffering well with one another. We have an opportunity to learn and to listen right now. Also, this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m., I want to invite you to a vigil. We're going to be doing a service of lament here at Cooper Road. All of you from every campus are invited to join us at 7 p.m. here at Cooper Road. You can find out more about that on social media. I'm going to continue in our series and we're gonna finish this series by talking about leadership in times of crisis. You might remember that Peter was writing to Christians scattered throughout the Roman Empire and they were marginalized, they were persecuted, uh, they were outcasts within their society. The apostle Paul described them as the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. You can't get much lower than that. They were persecuted and pressed. These people didn't just have the pressure of being Christians, but also just like us, a day away from economic disaster, a day away from another pandemic, a day away from being oppressed as minorities. And in the midst of crisis, you know, we become really fixated on leadership. We want our leaders to come along and fix our problems. And if they don't fix our problems, we're gonna let them know about it. We want a cure to this virus. We wanna get back to work. We want our leaders to stop racism within their organizations. But you know what? It's not just that we want leaders to fix our problems. We also want leaders when we are confused because right now we have so many questions. There's so much confusion and we run out and we listen to any voice that we can find. And so today, as we turn to 1 Peter, I wanna remind us that the most powerful book of leadership is right here. It's the Bible. It's most, more powerful than a whole library of books on leadership. It's more clear than any voice that you will turn to for help. And we're gonna see this as we look at chapter five of 1 Peter, but I wanna pray first and invite God's presence. So would you turn to the Lord and let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are here with us today. And in the midst of 
the crises that we face, Lord, in our nation and in our world, Lord, I want to turn my heart to you and I welcome you, church, to turn your hearts to the Lord, to welcome him. Lord, we don't need just good advice on leadership. We need you to be our leader. And so I pray that you would come, that you would speak a word to us, that you would bring encouragement, that you would breathe a fresh word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 5. Here's what we read. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. See, Peter here is talking about Christian leadership. And so I want you to apply the comments that I make to Christian leadership. And there are hundreds and hundreds of Christian leaders in our church that are listening right now. You may be a leader at one of our campuses, or you're a leader of our VC20, or our student ministry, or our kids in our worship ministry, men's, women's, small group leaders. There are so many places where you are leading in our church. And that doesn't include all of the outreach ministries and our mercy and justice ministries. Leaders, this is for you. I want you to hear about Christian leadership. He says in verse one, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. Now this term elder was it was borrowed from Jewish synagogue practice. And really what the term elder meant, it was used in Judaism to signify older men in the congregation who were leaders of the synagogue and in the nation. But in the New Testament, even though the New Testament borrows that term elder, elders didn't necessarily refer to those who were older and it didn't just refer to those who were men. You see, in the Bible, you see, actually, Timothy was a young leader who was also an elder. In the New Testament, the word elder primarily is dealing with a person's character. You see, character and integrity were foundational. They needed to be in place before anyone was to be a Christian leader or an elder. Christian leadership always starts with a foundation of character. Here's what he says. He, he says, leaders are to be examples to the flock. You see, you don't just need to be skilled to be a leader. You can't just be a good worship leader or be really good at serving in a ministry or at sharing your faith or teaching the Bible. You need to be an example. You see, being a Christian leader, I think, is one of the most demanding jobs in the world. And the reason is this, you got to bring your whole self to the game. You can't just bring part of yourself. I mean, think about that. You could be an incredible brain surgeon who is an adulterer cheating on your husband or wife. And you might still be the one that everyone goes to because it's like, I know that you are going to do a great job on my brain and I want that. Or, you might be a 747 pilot and you might be a total jerk to your whole staff and your whole team, but my goodness, you land the plane every single time and you wanna be on that plane. Well, it's different with Christian leadership. You don't just need to be good at what you do, the best that you can be at what you do, but you need to bring your whole person. It's about character. 
And Peter describes the most important character quality of all, and it's this. He says, hopeful leadership, first of all, is humble leadership. It's humble leadership. You see, he first speaks about pride. And by pride, Peter's not talking about healthy self-esteem. He's not saying that you shouldn't feel positively about yourself or that you need to think worse about yourself, have negative thoughts, bring yourself lower than you should be. He's not talking about healthy self-esteem. Pride is to give into the temptation to be like God. It's the temptation to create things in our image rather than God's image, to to push people into a mold of something like us rather than something like God. It's to treat people as our own ends rather than serve them unto God's ends. And you know, I don't know about you, but my goodness, I, I think pride sadly sounds like so much of the leadership in our culture right now. It's belligerent. It's arrogant, it's pompous, it's abusive. And we hear it every day. We turn on social media or we listen to so many of our leaders. God is inviting us to be a different kind of leader, a leader who is deeply humble. You see, humility runs through this whole passage. He he says, clothe yourselves with humility. And then he goes on and he says, God shows favor to the humble. He says, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. And I love what Peter does because it's not just the words he uses here. It's also what he says in other ways. See, one of the things that you see Peter doing is he's bringing himself down. He says this, I appeal as a fellow elder. Now that doesn't sound particularly striking to us when we hear that. But in that first century culture, it would have been shocking because leaders in that culture, you would use your position, your title to bring yourself up over other people. And Peter, if there's anyone, he could have totally done that. He could have said, listen, I'm the chief shepherd here. Jesus told me to feed the sheep. And so listen up, sheep. I got something to say to you. But he doesn't do that. He brings himself down. He actually starts by challenging leaders when in that culture, you would start by telling the followers what to do. He's humble. A few weeks ago, we we did a podcast with former governor John Kasich. And I asked him a question about Christian leadership. I said, uh, John, what does it mean that, uh, that you're a Christian and a leader? And I love what he said. He said, well, let me say I'm an idiot and a hypocrite. Let's get that right on the table right now. None of us can do these things. We all have failures. Admit them. I love it. He's a super brash guy, but he recognizes that leaders have failures. You're humble. The founder of the vineyard, John Wimber, he would always say it like this. Never trust a leader without a limp. It's so true. You see, leaders, we need to recognize that we are flesh and bone just like everyone else that people may look at us and think that we're more holy than we are, that they think that we've got more together than we do, that they think that we're smarter and more knowledgeable than we truly are. We need to recognize and be honest and humble about who we are. Let's not put on airs. And Peter doesn't just bring himself down, but look at what else he does. He says, he says that, they are not to lord it over those who were entrusted to them. In other words, they're not to manipulate. They're not to be in it for selfish reasons. They're not to be in it for themselves or to rip people off. But he says they must be eager 
to serve. Now that word serve, if there is one word, that is the defining word for all of Christian leadership. Now servant leadership has totally permeated leadership culture. If you go to any leading institution in our nation, whether where Pastor Charles went to Morehouse or to Harvard, to Stanford, and you study leadership and you show up on day one in a leadership class, you are gonna be hearing about servant leadership is one of the models of leadership. If you go out and you play volleyball or some other middle school sport, your coach is gonna be shouting at you and what those kids are gonna be hearing if they're a good coach is servant leadership principles. But think about this with me. Servant leadership wouldn't exist in our world if it weren't for Jesus Christ. It's incredible. He has so shaped our view of leadership that if we see someone who isn't a servant leader, we say they're a bad leader. Jesus is the only one who said, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is the one who said, for the first will be last and the last will be first. And it was only about Jesus that it was said that even though he was in the very nature God, that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Leaders are servants because Christ was a servant. And humility, like every other character quality, is something that it needs to be learned. It's something that develops in us over time. It's something that we need to be intentional about, but it's not just something that we're intentional about. It's something that God intentionally works in us. And if you would just think about your own life, you think about how God has worked humility into your life. When I was a kid and I was uh, a young follower of Jesus, I don't know if it's normal or not, but I, I dreamed about all of these heroes of the faith. I, I, I dreamed about Billy Graham, Martin Luther King Jr., missionaries that you know left everything and sacrificed it all to go to some other place in the world to serve and to love people. And, and I thought, man, if only I could do that, if only I could do something great, something grand, start a movement, be the revolution. And you know what? God has humbled me so many times. Even when we went to Amsterdam and, and you, you know that we went, we took a great team from Vineyard Columbus. We went to plant a church and, and I had all of these visions in my mind. Here's a world-class city, you know, the, just punching way above their weight class. We're going to go in there and we're going to plant the kind of church that highly creative, up and outers, really thoughtful cool people will come to and love and they're going to meet Jesus there. Now, listen, by God's grace, people met Jesus, but by God's grace, it was totally different than I thought it would be. You see, the first building that we met in was not this powerful, beautiful building. It was actually a drop-in center for homeless people. And that relevant community that I wanted to build was actually just full of misfits. I, I, I fell in love with them, but they were misfits. And that spectacular preacher of the gospel, I realized, well, it's just me. <laughs> I'm not that good. And fortunately, Julia was there and others. Listen, God taught me important lessons there. One of our first public meetings, one of our homeless friends, he was totally drunk and it wasn't on the spirit. He, he stood up and he started shouting obscenities in the middle of the meeting. It was the first time that we did a meeting and it was the first time a meeting was interrupted and it happened many times after that. It was so humbling for me. You see, God was doing more in me than through me. He was training me in humility. I'm so glad that I didn't plant the church that I dreamed of. 
Because the church that was planted looked so much more like the kingdom of God than what I had in my mind. If there's one book outside the Bible on leadership that I would recommend to you, out of all the great books that are out there, it's by a man that I respect and love, Henry Nouwen. And he wrote a book called In the Name of Jesus. And he talked about the three temptations that all leaders have. The temptation to be relevant, to be spectacular, and to be powerful. He said Jesus overcame all of those temptations and we need to as well. And here's what he says. He says, I am convinced that the Christian leader of the future is called to be completely irrelevant and to stand in this world with nothing to offer but his or her own vulnerable self. That's the way Jesus came to reveal God's love. The great message that we have to carry is that God loves us, not because of what we do or accomplish, but because God has created and redeemed us in love and has chosen to proclaim that love as the true source of all human life. You see, friends, if I'm honest, I I spend far too much energy trying to make myself more relevant, more spectacular, more powerful than the Lord wants me to be. It doesn't mean I should be less, but I certainly shouldn't be more. And I wonder if that would be true of you. I wonder today if we could say, you know what? God wants me just as I am, no more and no less. Hopeful leadership is humble leadership. And Peter tells us that hopeful leadership is also caring leadership. He says this in verse two, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Jesus uses the image of a shepherd here. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, shepherds are out in a pasture and the word pastor and pasture are related words. Shepherds were people of the pasture. They were pastors. And you think about all of the leaders in the Bible. I mean, so many of them were people who were shepherds. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, they they were all shepherds. Just common, everyday people. Not only that, but Moses was a shepherd. King David was a shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd that said, I am. I am the good shepherd who lays down my life for the sheep. You see, God is saying that what he wants in the heart of every Christian leader is this heart to love, to serve, to care for those that are under our care. Above all else, we need to have a caring heart. You know, we have at Vineyard Columbus 900 and 43 leaders. That's a lot of leaders. That's a lot of you who have said, I am going to commit to caring for our church. And I just want to say to you as pastor, thank you. Well done. You guys are doing an amazing job, but I know how fruitless it can feel. I feel the same way. It's like, man, am I making any difference? I'm calling people. I'm emailing people. I'm getting on social media. And I'm checking in with folks. Is it making any difference? It is. Hundreds of you are continuing to lead our groups. Thank you. That connection is so important. And I love hearing stories about how you're loving people, how you're serving people. I heard a group about a group this week that uh, one of the, the members uh, was moving away to get their PhD. And the group surprised them and said, hey, uh, can you go out in your garage? We, we, I just want to get something from you. And, uh, and at the same time, the whole group filed by in all of their cars with signs, waving, saying, we love you. We're going to miss you. They left a gift. Another group, uh, just a normal small group has become really a support group for homeschooling parents because all of these parents are now homeschooling. It's like, I don't know how to do that. They're coming together. They're supporting each other, bringing resources to each other. 
I got a call or an email this week from one of our leaders, Art. And I loved it. He said, Eric, every day, every afternoon, I try to think of two people that I know that are alone or maybe lonely, maybe just need someone to reach out to them and say, hey, I try to give them a call. I love that. I love what you are doing, leaders. You are doing a great job and you are showing the heart of the Lord to care for the flock. And I want to invite you because I know some of you are listening and you're like, I want to be a part of that. This Thursday, we have Midpoint starting. It's a way for you to jump into community. Get connected. This week, you can join us on Thursday. You can go on our website and get registered for Midpoint. Hopeful leadership is caring leadership. And lastly, hopeful leadership, it requires self-leadership. Man, it has not been easy for any of us to get through every day of this pandemic. I'm more tired, more lethargic, less prayerful, uh, less hopeful (laughs) at certain moments. And, And I find that it's really requiring me to dig deep to lead myself. It's really hard to lead myself. But when you're feeling isolated, when you're feeling alone, when you're feeling cut off, it's hard. But before we can lead others, we have to learn to lead ourselves. And Peter tells us about two areas that require us to lead ourselves. The first he, he talks about on the one hand, where we experience anxieties. He says in verse seven, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And on the other hand, he says, it's not just anxiety, but there's temptations. And in verse eight, he says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour, resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You know, what Peter tells us here is that a leader isn't someone who has it all together. A leader isn't someone who's got it all figured out. A leader is someone who brings their anxieties to the Lord. A leader is someone who says, you know what? I'm being tempted right now. I'm not doing okay right now. I'm struggling right now. And there are so many ways that we are struggling. You know, it might be because of this pandemic. Some of you are out of work. Some of you are wondering with so much uncertainty about what the coming weeks and months are going to look like. Some of you are at home and you're with your kids and you're just experiencing tremendous amounts of frustration. Others of you are experiencing loneliness. Some of you, anxiety. There are so many of you that I spoke with earlier as our world is coming apart this week. You're just experiencing lots of anger, sadness, grief real frustration. And you know, the Lord is inviting us no matter where you are. I especially think of those who are parents and you're raising kids and you're afraid. You're afraid for your child. I wonder if you could bring that fear. I wonder if you could bring that frustration Whatever it is, could we just take a moment right now as we close and just take a moment and quiet yourself. Close your eyes. Maybe open your hands. And I ask Holy Spirit that you might reveal one place in my heart that you would want to touch right now. 
one place that I need to open up to you. Because Lord, only you and you alone are able to heal me. You and you alone are able to give me courage where I have fear. You and you alone are able to replace anxiety with peace. And so could you bring that one thing to the Lord right now? And what I want to do as we close is Janine is going to lead us in a beautiful song called Humble King. And you may even want to just kneel down before the Lord as we sing this song and bring him all of yourself today and invite the Holy Spirit to touch you. Let's worship together. Show me how much you love humility. Oh, Spirit, be the star that leads me to the humble heart of love I see. It's been wonderful to worship with you today, Vineyard family. A couple of things as we go. This week, on Sunday, we have Recognition Sunday. And what we're doing is we are honoring and recognizing those that are moving on from 5th, 8th, 
and 12th grades. It is a big deal. We want to celebrate them. And at 2 p.m. at our Cooper Road parking lot, this is for all of our campuses. All of our student leaders are going to be there. It's going to be a big party. And your student will be able to experience incredible blessing from Vineyard Columbus. So make sure you hop online and register for that right now. Don't forget, get them registered. That's going to be next Sunday. Also, as I already mentioned, this coming Wednesday, we're going to be doing a service of, of lament. It's going to be at 7 o'clock here at our Cooper Road campus. It's for all of our campuses. It's going to be a time of prayer, uh, of reflection, of reconciliation, of grieving and healing together. We need moments like this to come together and to be healed. There's only 400 spaces and so you need to register for that as well. You can register on our website, but I want to invite you out to that. It's going to be a great event for us all. I'd like to pray a closing blessing over you as we go. I want to pray the, the, the parting words from Peter in 1 Peter. So would you open your hands as I pray this blessing over you? And may the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after, after you have suffered a little while, may he restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. 